2016, a story occurred that shocked everyone with its cruelty. A young woman was stalked by her ex-boyfriend who became increasingly dangerous with each passing day. At one point, she even had to turn to the police, but what happened next shocked all of Great Britain. Today, we will tell you about what happened to Alice Ruggles. Alice Ruggles was born on December 24, 1991, exactly one day before Christmas. Her parents, Sue Hills and Clive Ruggles, already had two children and later another boy was born in the family. They lived in the tiny English village of Torlangton, located in Lake Tis Higher County. The family was very close-knit and the older children always took care of Alice and her younger brother. In the local school, the girl started attending a drama club and quickly fell in love with acting. She participated in many theatrical productions and all her teachers noted her natural talent. After graduating from high school at the age of 18, Alice enrolled in Northumbria University where she studied design. After receiving her diploma in 2014, she moved to a city called Gateshead and got a job at the major British media company Sky. Alice rented an apartment with her roommates because it was difficult for her to afford separate housing at first. In October 2015, when the young woman was 23, she met a man named Harry Dillon. He stumbled upon her account on Facebook through a mutual friends page. They started talking and soon became fond of each other. Through a student program, he transferred from a local Indian university to Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh. After completing his studies, he decided to stay in England and join the army. After some time, he was sent to Afghanistan where he started communicating with Alice on Facebook. At first, they just exchanged messages, then began calling each other several times a week and eventually started a relationship. They eagerly awaited the moment when Harry would return to Great Britain to finally meet. When it happened, they went on several dates and Harry made a good impression on Alice. They had a great time and the mutual attraction between them only grew stronger. However, after a few weeks, they had to separate again. Harry had to go back to Afghanistan for two more months, after which they planned to continue the relationship. The couple continued to communicate online until Harry finally returned to England in April. He lived in a military base in Edinburgh, which was almost 200 kilometers away from the city where Alice lived, but Harry tried to visit her whenever he could. Months after Harry's return to England, Alice invited him to a family celebration and it seemed like their relationship was getting stronger. But over time, acquaintances began to notice significant changes in her behavior. Previously, she was always cheerful, sociable, and positive, but something was changing in her every day. Before we continue, I have a small request for you. We've created a new channel where we upload content related to old, historical ruins, and interesting events. So, if you're interested, kindly subscribe to my channel, Decoverize, for daily interesting videos and show some love in the comments. I'll read every one of your comments. The link is in the description. Alice became withdrawn, depressed, and stopped spending time with friends. She even stopped communicating with them in social media and no one could understand what was happening to her. She had a fight with her apartment neighbors. She packed her things and moved to her colleague's apartment. Alice's family and friends began to suspect that her new boyfriend Harry was the cause of these significant changes. At first she was reluctant to share her relationship problems but it became impossible to hide them over time. It turned out that Harry was not the kind and caring man he was in the first months after they met. The longer their relationship lasted, the more he tried to control every aspect of Alice's life. Harry was against her hanging out with friends or talking to other men, even if they were her old acquaintances or work colleagues. He began to monitor her social media conversations and constantly accused her of wanting to cheat on him. Every time she talked to friends or planned to go out with them, Harry would throw a tantrum. But what was even more interesting, Harry began openly cheating on Alice, meeting women from Tinder for one-night stands without any commitment. After that, he often talked about these women to Alice to make her jealous. It even got to the point where one of these women wrote to Alice on social media in August. At that moment, the young woman decided to break up with Harry, but he didn't want to let her go. He bombarded Alice with messages and calls, trying to get her back by any means necessary. At first, he said that he loved her, cried on the phone, and promised to change for the better. Then he began openly manipulating the young woman, promising to take his own life and blaming her for everything. It even got to direct threats. It turned out that Harry had secretly taken pictures of Alice while she was changing clothes and he threatened to post these pictures on the internet if she didn't come back to him. In the end, Alice decided to simply ignore him and then Harry changed tactics. He started calling her friends and relatives asking them to reason with the young woman. 
Realizing that this also didn't work, he began writing her letters with poems about his love for her. However, soon he once again resorted to threats and blackmail. But Alice still didn't respond to these letters. Later, it turned out that Harry had managed to hack her Facebook account and was monitoring her correspondence. From there, he found out that since September, Alice had started communicating with a man named Mike, who was an army officer and was in another country at the time. Harry was furious. He began writing to Mike that Alice was still in the with him and sleeping with him, and also wrote various nasty things about her. But by that time, Mike already knew about Harry and didn't pay any attention to his words. He continued his relationship with Alice and it seemed that the young woman had managed to get out of this whole situation with Harry. She became sociable, cheerful, and happy again. But unfortunately, this didn't last long. On September 30th, Harry left her a voice message begging her to pick up the phone. Alice ignored him and then he decided to go to her house. The man drove two and a half hours from his military base to her apartment, but then he behaved quite strangely. First, he rang the doorbell and ran away. Alice was at home, but she didn't open the door because she didn't see anyone through the peephole. The situation repeated several times. Then, a few hours later, Harry climbed over the fence and approached the window of her bedroom. Alice lived on the first floor of a two-story house with a fenced area. Harry knocked on the window and hid, leaving a box of candy and a bouquet on the windowsill. What happened greatly frightened Alice. She immediately understood that Harry was behind all of it. She briefly saw a man hiding outside her field of view, but that wasn't all. While hiding in her yard, Harry recorded several creepy voice messages, the content of which caused Alice real panic. One of them began with the words, you said guys like me end up killing people. After these words, he began repeating, multiple times, that he didn't want to kill her. From his voice, Alice felt like he was primarily trying to convince himself of what he said. Finally, he wished her good night and left. All of this was already enough for Alice to contact the police. After what happened, she began to seriously fear for her life and didn't know how else to protect herself from Harry. The operator offered her two options for solving the problem. She could obtain a restraining order against Harry or ask the police to issue an official police information notice known in Great Britain as a pin and allowed the police to arrest the man if he approached or contacted Alice. The young woman chose the latter option. The next day the police came to her, took a statement and assured her that Harry would face the consequences if he bothered her again. After some time, the police called the military unit and informed the commanding officer about the measures taken against Harry. Interestingly, the police did not contact him personally, even by phone, let alone a personal visit, although they were obliged to do so by law. Learning that Alice had contacted the police, he became angry and wrote her another letter, along with a box of items that reminded him of her. In the letter, he said that because of her complaint, his phone, tablet, and laptop were taken away from him. He also promised not to bother her again. But Alice knew for sure he wouldn't just calm down like that. When she first contacted the police, they told her to call them immediately if Harry contacted her again. So she did. She told the operator about the letter and the box of items, but he didn't know what action to take in this case. Moreover, he asked Alice herself what actions she expected from them. In the end, he promised her that another officer would call her back. Of course, this response from the police shocked Alice and she had no idea what to do next. Several hours later, an officer did call her back and listen to her entire story. He then asked if she wanted the police to arrest Harry and here, Alice made a fatal mistake. She felt sorry for him and answered negatively. However, even if he had been arrested, Harry would not have received any punishment. He would have been held for some time in the station and released. After this, Alice realized that the police could not help her in the situation that had arisen, so she was left to rely only on herself. On October 12th, five days after she went to the police, Alice remained depressed and frightened. She hoped to distract herself from these troubling thoughts over the weekend. Mike was supposed to come see her and they planned to spend the next few days together. That evening, Alice returned home from work and her neighbor was not home. She began to prepare for bed while chatting with Mike about their upcoming meeting, but she did not know that Harry had been standing in the courtyard of her building and watching her. Taking advantage of the fact that Alice had left the window slightly open, he climbed into her bedroom and went to the kitchen where he took a knife and went to the bathroom where Alice was. The events that followed unfolded rapidly. Harry struck her 24 times with the knife, causing Alice to die almost instantly. After that, he left the apartment, got into his car, and drove back to his military unit. In less than an hour, Alice's neighbor returned home and found that the front door was locked from the inside. 
She knocked several times hoping Alice would answer, but she did not. Then the neighbor went to the backyard to knock on the window of Alice's bedroom, but what she saw shocked her. Through the open window, she saw Alice laying on the bathroom floor in a pool of blood. She immediately called the police in a panic and told them what had happened, adding, we knew this was going to happen. Her ex is a real psychopath. Less than two minutes later, the neighbor heard police sirens approaching and with them came paramedics who confirmed Alice's death. It became immediately obvious to them that the conversation was about a murder. In connection with the fact that the neighbor named Harry Dillon as a potential killer, the police immediately began to search for him. After running the numbers of his car, they found that the man had driven from Edinburgh to Newcastle that day. His car appeared on several surveillance cameras. Just a few hours later, the police arrived at the military base and arrested Harry. They took him to the station and began to interrogate him. The man admitted that he had gone to see Alice but denied any involvement in the murder. According to him, he came to talk to her and she allegedly came out onto the street and hit him in the face during the conversation. After that, Harry allegedly got into his car and drove back to the base, but detectives quickly found out that his story had nothing to do with reality. From the surveillance cameras, they learned that Harry had arrived at Alice's house even before she returned from work. He parked his car and waited. But that's not all and found that while Harry was sitting in the car, he was messaging with a random girl on Tinder and arranging to meet her that same night. Detectives also found blood stains on the steering wheel of Harry's car and analysis showed that this blood belonged to Alice. Moreover, the man stole her phone and took it with him, which is why the geolocation of the device completely matched the movements of the killer that day, to bring charges of murder and send the case to court. However, the first hearing took place only almost a year later in April 2017. Harry's lawyers realized that with such a set of evidence against her client, they needed to come up with a new story. As a result, the man claimed that he had actually come to Alice's house to collect his things, but they had an argument and then Alice allegedly took a knife and attacked him, accidentally inflicting 24 wounds on herself. After that, he watched her die and even heard her last words. She allegedly said that she hated her family. Of course, this delusional story was not taken seriously. Moreover, during the court hearings, another gruesome fact emerged. Before the murder, Harry had visited Alice's house several times, sneaked into the backyard, and took pictures. According to the prosecution, he carefully planned the murder in advance. Eleven days later, the court handed down a guilty verdict, life imprisonment with the possibility of applying for parole in 22 years. During the reading of the verdict, the judge noted that Harry showed no remorse or compassion. Instead, he was focused only on inventing the most plausible story. Another horrific detail from Harry's past came to light during the trial. Three years before these events, his ex-girlfriend obtained a restraining order against him because he was stalking her in the same way he would later stalk Alice, but the police simply did not know about it. After the murder, society and the media harshly criticized the police, accusing them of failing to protect Alice from a dangerous psychopath, letting the case go unchecked. Later, two officers were disciplined. The army also came under fire. The public was outraged that such an unbalanced and dangerous person was allowed to join. In addition, no action was taken against Harry when the pin was issued against him. Sometime later, Alice's family launched a foundation named In Her Honor. Its goal was to work towards ensuring the victims of stalking receive immediate and proper assistance from the police. That law enforcement agencies simply cannot provide such protection, so legislative changes are needed. In 2019, a law was passed that simplifies the issuance of restraining orders against people who stalk their victims. However, Alice's family continues to work on the foundation and hopes that it will help change the situation in the country for the better. Now, all her relatives and acquaintances believe that this tragedy could have been avoided if the police had taken their duties more seriously. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it. A young woman went home on New Year's Eve and disappeared, not even making it 150 meters to her apartment. The police immediately began an investigation, which became the largest in the district. Only a month later, they were able to uncover a shocking truth that no one was prepared for. She was the youngest of four children with two sisters and a brother. They all lived together in a city called Hall. From a young age, Rachel was interested in music and dance, particularly ballet. She excelled in school and went on to attend a local college to study information technology. Later, she changed her focus and decided to pursue her passion for dance. While in college, Rachel met a guy named Mark. 
the two soon started dating. After some time, they decided to move in together and rented an apartment in a quiet residential area. The residential complex was just a kilometer away from Rachel's parents' home, so she would often visit them. Rachel also got a part-time job at a local bakery as a cake decorator. She quickly fell in love with this activity and began to consider pursuing a culinary education. In December 2002, when Rachel was 21, she and her boyfriend decided to get two kittens. Rachel took care of them, devoting most of her free time to them. Rachel and Mark made sure not to leave the kittens alone for too long, so they always tried to plan their activities so that one of them was at home and looking after the animals. As a result, they had already planned how they would celebrate New Year's Eve. Mark was supposed to go to his parents' house and come back home by night, while Rachel planned to go to a bar with her brother and celebrate New Year's Eve there. After that, she was supposed to return with her brother to her parents' house and spend the night there. On the evening of December 31st, Rachel met up with her brother and they went to a bar. Some mutual friends joined them at the bar and the group celebrated the new year. After midnight, Rachel and her brother left the establishment and arrived at their parents' home around 1.20 a.m. Before going to bed, Rachel talked to her mother and decided to call her boyfriend to see how he was doing. However, Mark did not answer the home phone, so she called his mobile. This time he picked up and said that friends had invited him to a party. Rachel was upset that Mark had left the house contrary to their agreement and left the kittens alone all night. She decided not to stay at her parents' house and planned to go home. Upon learning this, her mother tried to dissuade her daughter as it was late at night and she was concerned for her safety. Despite their lengthy argument, Rachel still headed home, promising to call her mother as soon as she arrived. Her mother waited for about an hour and a half, but there was no call from her daughter. She then called Rachel first on her mobile and then on her home phone, but there was no answer. She thought that Rachel might have gone to the party where her boyfriend was and that was why she wasn't answering the phone. The mother tried to reach her until about 4.30 a.m., but eventually decided to go to sleep. She woke up around 10 a.m. and saw that her husband was on the phone. She hoped that he had spoken to Rachel, but it was their eldest daughter on the line. She called her parents because she could not reach Rachel all morning and was causing her a lot of worry. Realizing that the young woman still hadn't returned home, all of her relatives began to panic. They continued to try to call her. And after some time, Mark answered the phone. The boy was surprised when he was asked, is Rachel home? He said that he had returned home at around 7 a.m. and the young woman wasn't there. The young man thought that she had stayed overnight with her parents, so he didn't think much of it and went to sleep. According to Mark, there were no signs that Rachel had been home. Her things were missing. The bed was made up as it was when he left and no one had fed the kittens. All of this made Rachel's family panic even more. They called all of their daughter's friends and other relatives, but no one had seen her that night. Rachel's parents then decided to contact the police. Despite the fact that Rachel was almost 22 years old and investigators could have waited some time after the disappearance of an adult, in this case, decided to start searching immediately. They searched her apartment and talked to all of her relatives and friends. The police immediately dismissed the idea that Rachel had simply run away on her own. Her entire biography and stories from close people contradicted such a possibility. During the conversation with the investigators, Rachel's mother remembered one moment that night when Rachel was going back to her apartment. Her mother started arguing with her literally on the doorstep of the house where they stood with the door open while the woman tried to persuade her daughter to stay. At some point, an unknown man walked down the street and Rachel's mother even thought about asking him to accompany her daughter home but changed her mind. After receiving a rather superficial description of this person, the police began searching for him. As he was walking in the same direction that Rachel was going to a few minutes later, so he might have seen something. They sent out descriptions to all patrol officers and continued to look for other clues. Detectives started to look into Mark, the boyfriend of the missing young woman. Firstly, they found out that there was an argument between them on the night when Rachel learned that he had gone to a party. During the conversation with the police, Mark didn't seem upset despite his girlfriend's disappearance in the middle of the night. All of this led investigators to believe that he might have something to do with her disappearance. So they decided to check his alibi. Mark claimed that he returned from the party after 6 a.m. The police talked to all the people who were there and they confirmed the young man's words. The young woman's relatives also insisted that he would never harm her. Investigators requested data from Rachel's mobile phone operator and bank. They found out that since her disappearance, she had not used her phone or bank cards. 
At that time, they could not track the location of her phone and data from cell towers was practically useless at such a short distance. After that, the police decided to obtain all records from surveillance cameras within a 10-kilometer radius of her route. They sent patrols to every store and also spoke to residents in these areas, hoping that someone had security cameras installed. Soon they managed to spot Rachel on one of the cameras, just a couple hundred meters from her residential complex. This once again confirmed that she was heading home and not somewhere else. Detectives focused their search on this area. They brought in search dogs, helicopters, and dozens of officers who combed the streets, fields, and waterways. They also began to drain streams and artificial canals to fully search them, but all of this yielded no results. Days went by and the police increasingly leaned towards the possibility that Rachel may no longer be alive. They continued their active and extensive search. Two weeks later, they had their first worrying lead. One of the nearby channels had dried up and they found Rachel's shoe inside, the same shoe she was wearing when she left her mother's house. The next day, they found a garbage bag in the same channel with a woman's purse containing cosmetics, a phone, and other items, including Rachel Moran's passport. These items led her family and investigators to believe that she was most likely dead and the police continued to search the channels. They considered the possibility that an unknown perpetrator had dumped Rachel's body there, but further searches yielded no results. In the following days, detectives put even more effort into the case. They decided to use a popular tactic in England where police found a woman who looked like Rachel, dressed her in similar clothing to what Rachel was wearing on the night of her disappearance, and asked her to retrace Rachel's steps. The whole thing was filmed and later handed over to local TV stations by investigators. The purpose of this experiment was to find witnesses who may have seen Rachel on the night she disappeared but didn't attach any significance to it or had forgotten. In this case, visual reconstruction of events might help them remember details, and it worked. After the footage was made public, several people contacted the police and shared their observations. The detectives checked them, but ultimately it didn't lead to any useful information. However, they did manage to obtain something significant. In addition to the witnesses, owners of CCTV cameras installed in the area also approached them. During the first few days of the investigation, the police had received most they missed some, which proved valuable. The management of a school located approximately 150 meters from Rachel's apartment handed over their footage from the night. The police officer saw a woman walking in the direction of the same residential complex. The recording quality was very poor, but based on the time, investigators assumed it was Rachel. Just a few seconds later, someone else walked by and the detectives thought it could be the unknown criminal who might have attacked her. Unfortunately, the recording quality did not allow them to see any features. Then the police assumed that if this person was behind Rachel's abduction, he wouldn't have been able to drag her body too far because he was without a car. They assumed within a two-kilometer radius of that location. Of course, they needed the resident's permission as well as a lot of time. Therefore, the investigators hired more than a hundred officers who knocked on all residential buildings and apartments asking for permission to search the premises. The police started their work on January 28th and divided themselves into groups of three, each of which included a specialist who knew how to properly search the premises. Several hours later, one of these groups came to Nash Court Street and the police officers began knocking on every door. After they reached the last apartment, something alarming awaited them. They immediately called the chief detective and asked him to come there urgently. When the police officers knocked on the last door, a man opened it and let them in. The officers searched the premises but didn't notice anything suspicious. However, before leaving, one of them saw a small garbage storage closet, which was quite common in such apartments, and they decided to check it out. But the closet door was locked. Officers asked the man to give them the key, but he said he couldn't remember where it was. They continued to insist that he look for the key. To make sure that there was nothing in his apartment, the man searched the apartment and after some time, he finally found the key. The police opened the door and found many garbage bags, empty packages, boxes, and other items inside. They began to clean up the mess since the closet was filled to the brim. At some point, one of the officers froze, having pulled out another bag. He saw a human foot. After a few seconds, he retrieved the rest of the garbage and realized that Rachel Moran's body was in front of him, wrapped in a blanket and barely fitting in the closet. The room was very low and the officers were greatly surprised at how the criminal managed to fit a human body in there. The police immediately arrested the apartment owner and his friend who was visiting him at the time of their visit. 
The tenant was 23-year-old Michael Little who reacted calmly to his arrest, but his friend was shocked by what was happening. He did not see what was in the closet and did not understand why they were being detained. After arresting them, the officers called the chief detective and waited for his arrival. Initially, one car arrived at the scene and the police took the apartment owner's friend to the station. Little remained in the apartment with another officer waiting for the next crew. The officer decided not to waste time and tried to talk to the man. To his surprise, Little almost immediately began to confess to all the details of what had happened. He started his story with the words, I'm so glad you found her. I've been wanting to tell someone about this for a long time. He told the officer the chronology of events that led to the young woman's death, but the officer considered this version to be questionable. According to Little, on New Year's Eve, he noticed Rachel on the street. He approached and spoke to her, inviting her to his apartment, and the young woman agreed, and they went to his place. There they drank Little, after which a quarrel broke out between them. Little did not specify the reason, but only said that he left for another room. Returning to the kitchen, he saw that Rachel was standing with her back to him. The man approached her and noticed that the young woman was holding a knife in her hand and the next second she turned to him and cut his hand. Little panicked, grabbed the kitchen knife, and struck her which resulted in Rachel's death. The police doubted the truthfulness of this story as it sounded quite illogical. However, they recorded Little's confession and soon took him to the station. During questioning, he confirmed everything he had told the officer and insisted that he acted in self-defense. When asked why he didn't call the police in that case, Little stated that he was scared and thought that no one would believe him, so he decided to hide the body in his closet. Studying his biography, the police learned that Little had an impressive criminal history. From an early age, he was caught stealing and committing other minor offenses. He was expelled from school several times, as a result of which he did not even receive a basic education. The man practically did not work, stayed at home, used alcohol and drugs. The police talked to several of his friends who said that Little often fantasized about meeting different women. Once he even told them that he was dating a beautiful blonde, who was 180 centimeters tall, although his friends knew perfectly well that he was not in a relationship with anyone. This detail seemed interesting to the detectives. Rachel had approximately the same height and light hair. They assumed that Little fantasized about a young woman of this type and could choose Rachel as his victim based on these parameters. At the same time, the police established that the young woman was not acquainted with Little, although they lived on neighboring streets. The investigators attempted to reconstruct the timeline of that night and found out that on the evening of December 31st, the suspect met with his friends to prepare for New Year's Eve. But Little left their company. He became angry when the young woman he was trying to flirt with left with his friend. Little then went to another party. But shortly after midnight, he said he was going home. The route from the party location followed the same road that Rachel was walking on. Combining all the available facts, the detectives came to a disturbing conclusion. Remember that stranger who passed Rachel and her mother when she was trying to persuade her daughter not to walk home and even thought about asking that man to accompany Rachel? According to the police, that person was little. This version was indirectly confirmed by surveillance camera footage. Detectives reviewed the recordings where Rachel was first recorded. About three minutes before that moment, a man, who looked like Little, walked along the same road. But on the second recording, everything changed. Hen Rachel was captured by another camera and unknown man was already walking behind her. If it was Little, he would have had to stop somewhere and wait for the young woman to pass, after which he began to pursue her. This version of events contradicted the man's own account, but even more contradictions arose after medical experts presented the reports on the victim's body. They found 27 stab wounds inflected with tremendous force and Rachel had no defensive wounds, despite Little's claim of struggling with her. In addition, some of the blows were delivered to the young woman's back and, as for the suspect himself, no cuts were found on his hands. All these facts unequivocally indicated that his story did not match reality. Based on all the available data, the detectives arrived at a more plausible version. That night, Little was angry because he was rejected at the first party. As he passed by Rachel's mother's house, he overheard part of their conversation and understood that Rachel was going home alone. Rachel also fit the type of woman that Little fantasized about and he decided to either attack her or try to talk to her. Moving forward, he left the main road and waited for Rachel to pass by, then began to follow her. The situation could have developed in two scenarios, or tried to flirt with her. In the second case, Rachel would likely have ignored him and walked away. Firstly, she had a boyfriend. Secondly, she wouldn't have gone to the home of a stranger who approached her on the street in the middle of the night. 
And thirdly, Rachel was very concerned about her kittens. When she found out that her boyfriend had left them all night, she couldn't think of anything else and tried to get home as quickly as possible. That he attacked the young woman when she was as close to his house as possible and dragged her into his apartment. Soon the forensic experts found evidence of this. There were traces of dirt on the back of Rachel's legs, indicating that she had been dragged on the ground. Forensic experts also established that the young woman was not killed in the kitchen, but in the hallway. That's where most of the bloodstains were found which the perpetrator tried to wash off. In connection with this, the police suggested that Little killed her immediately after they were in the apartment. Nevertheless, the medical experts found that the victim had been subjected to violence and Little's DNA was found on her body. Given the alleged chronology of events, by that time Rachel could already be dead. On January 31st, Little was charged with murder. However, by that time, Little had already hired a lawyer and decided to retract his initial statement claiming that he did not kill anyone. In the end, the case was taken to court and the trial began in October where Little's lawyers presented a new version of events. Now the man claimed that the real killer was his friend, Mark Fuller. The same person who was arrested with him on the day the body was discovered but later released as no evidence linked him to the crime. Little claimed that he returned to the house closer to morning and saw his friend and Rachel there. Mark told him that they had met the young woman and decided to go to Little's apartment since Mark had the keys. They all drank together, after which Rachel went with Little to the bedroom and had intimate contact with him. Soon after that, a furious Mark burst into the room. He had feelings for the young woman and went into a rage upon learning about their relationship. He grabbed a knife and inflicted numerous blows on Rachel, then threatened Little. He demanded that Little help him clean up the blood and never tell anyone about what had happened. Otherwise, he threatened to kill not only him, but also his loved ones. As you can guess, nobody believed this story. It contradicted not only the evidence, but also common sense. Everything pointed to Little being the killer, and there was not a single piece of evidence implicating his friend. The trial ended quickly because the defense was unable to present any evidence refuting their client's guilt. As a result, Little was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. With the possibility of parole in 25 years, meaning he could be released at the age of 58 if his request is approved. Rachel's murder was a strong blow to all of her relatives, but her older sister suffered the most. The young woman had diabetes and the illness had a significant impact on her health in the wake of the stress she endured. After a prolonged struggle, she passed away in 2010. And her family blames little for everything, so this criminal's actions led to two deaths. Feel free to share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to like this video and subscribe. A young woman who worked at a jewelry store disappeared without a trace during her lunch break. When investigators began to unravel this mystery, they were only able to find a few unusual clues and witnesses. Only several decades later, the truth finally became known and it was a big surprise for the detectives. Linda Reed was born in 1962 in the Australian city of Gold Coast. She grew up in a loving family, was a cheerful and energetic child, and had many friends. In her school years, Linda met a guy named Robert. The couple began dating and, at 19 years old, the young woman married him. They dreamed of creating a large and friendly family as well as building the house of their dreams. The newlyweds started working on this almost immediately after the wedding. They bought a plot of land and began saving a significant portion of their income for construction. In order to have the house ready as soon as possible, the couple decided not to spend money on rent and lived in a trailer on Robert's parents' backyard. Linda got a job as a salesperson at a jewelry store located in a large shopping center. She immediately liked this job, found common ground with the team, and the decent income allowed her to save up for her dream home even faster. December 1983 was a tense month as there was a frenzy in the store due to the approaching holidays. Linda, who was 21 years old at the time, had to work in an intensified mode. December 13th was no exception. Linda worked diligently and only at 12 p.m. that she had the opportunity to take a break. Usually she had lunch in the same shopping center and returned earlier than the allotted time, but on that day it didn't happen. Linda's colleagues were very surprised that she did not return from her break at the appointed time as the young woman had never been late before. The workday went on, and Linda still did not show up. Everything looked as if she had simply decided to leave her shift without informing her colleagues, but they doubted that the young woman could do such a thing as she approached her job with the utmost responsibility. Her husband was also surprised when Linda did not return home after her shift. 
He waited for some time and then contacted her colleagues. They told the man that his wife did not return from her break and Robert started to seriously worry. He went to the shopping center and started walking around in search of Linda. After that, he visited several other places that the young woman regularly frequented, but she was nowhere to be found. With each passing minute of searching, he became increasingly concerned that something bad had happened to Linda. So, by 7 p.m. that evening, the man decided to call the police. The operator told him that a report of a missing adult would only be accepted after 24 hours had passed since the disappearance. Linda's mother also tried to contact them, but received the same response. In the end, the relatives had to wait until the next day before the report was accepted. The police began investigating and tried to find out what Linda was doing during her break. They learned that the young woman went shopping for New Year's presents in several stores located in the same building. After that, she visited her bank branch and received a check to pay bills. The last person to see her was the shopping center security guard who noticed Linda leaving the parking lot in her car. The police could not find any other information. The young woman's relatives had no idea why Linda left in the middle of her shift and, most importantly, where she was headed. The police sent out alerts for the young woman and her car and began keeping an eye on Robert. According to statistics, husbands are more likely to commit crimes against their wives, but in this case, Robert had a reliable alibi. No other suspects were found, and according to everyone who knew Linda, she never had enemies and was generally a very positive person. As investigators tried to find new leads, several days had passed since Linda's disappearance. On the third day, the police received a report about an abandoned car that matched the description of the young woman's car. It was located in a suburban area, 20 kilometers from the shopping center. Arriving at the scene, the police realized that it was indeed Linda's car. The vehicle was parked on the side of the road next to bushes. In the 1980s, this area was almost undeveloped, with most of it covered in bushes and trees. Inside the car, the police found Christmas presents that Linda had bought before her disappearance. The doors were unlocked, and the ignition key was inside. In the salon, the police found an unusual clue. An empty menthol cigarette pack was lying next to the front passenger seat. Linda and Robert never smoked, so investigators came to the most obvious conclusion. The pack could belong to the kidnapper. The police immediately began to search for evidence, and soon they made a sad discovery. About 40 meters from the car in the stream bed of a small creek, they found Linda's body. Her hands were tied with a bikini and eyeglass cord. The victim's relatives said that she never owned either of these items. Medical experts determined that the cause of death was asphyxiation and the young woman was also subjected to violence. But at that time, specialists could not extract a DNA sample from the criminal. Thus, the investigators presented an approximate chronology of events. In their opinion, an unknown criminal attacked Linda in the parking lot of a shopping center when she came to put the gifts she bought in the car. He forced her to sit behind the wheel and drive to the place where they later found her body. After that, he subjected her to violence and killed her. There were no leads that could lead the investigators to a suspect. They decided to try to interview all the visitors of the shopping center who were there during Linda's lunch break. Of course, this was an extremely difficult task. To attract people's attention, the police took the victim's car and placed it in the shopping center, attaching a photo of the young woman and information about her disappearance to it. Investigators hoped that such a visual installation would help visitors who saw Linda that day remember some details. Several witnesses told the police that they saw a teenager with light hair in the shopping center parking lot, but investigators could not identify him. Other witnesses told something more interesting. On the day of Linda's disappearance, they they saw a man who was trying to catch a ride on the highway less than a kilometer from where the victim's body was found. Soon the driver of the van turned to the police and reported that on the same day he had picked up a man who was hitchhiking on the road in the same location where other witnesses had seen him. Here's where things got interesting. The driver recounted that the man was smoking menthol cigarettes, but he was holding them all in his hand without a pack. Since an empty pack of menthol cigarettes was found in the victim's car, this became the first significant lead for investigators. Forensic specialists examined the driver's van and found a fingerprint on the glass near the passenger seat that did not match the owner's prints. Unfortunately, a comparison with existing databases did not yield any results. The suspect's description that the driver provided was also superficial and did not help the authorities find the man. No other evidence was found and the investigation into this case came to a standstill for many months. A 
A new lead only appeared just over a year later in 1985 when a prisoner in one of the gave investigators an interesting tip. His cellmate, Craig Andrew McConnell, had confessed to him about Linda Reed's murder. According to Craig, he and another man were trying to steal a car from the parking lot of a shopping center when Linda noticed them. Fearing that she would remember their faces and report them to the police, the criminals abducted and killed her. Detectives had come across this name before. Craig had received two life sentences for murders committed in 1984 and he was considered a suspect in Linda's case. But the police could not find any connection at the time. After the tip from the informant, they talked to Craig in prison, but he claimed that he had nothing to do with the murder. He added that his cellmate had made it all up and they never talked about the case. But the police were not. Quick to believe him. Craig committed two brutal murders just a few months after Linda's death and the story told by the informant could very well be true. Forensic experts compared the suspect's fingerprints to those found on the van's glass, but they did not match. Despite this, the detectives continued to consider Craig as a possible killer and in 1986 they decided to bring the case to trial. The only arguments against him were the words of an informant. However, he himself did not live to see the start of the trial. The man died shortly before from an overdose of illegal substances. Nevertheless, the prosecution had his entire story. According to the informant, Craig drew him a rough map of the place where he left Linda's body. Experts concluded that it matched the terrain fairly accurately, right down to the location of the trees. In addition, Craig said that Linda told the kidnappers that Rob would seek revenge. The young woman really did often call her husband by his incomplete name. The suspect also told the informant that he ate a cheese and vegetable sandwich that belonged to Linda. After her car was found, experts did find traces of cheese in her purse. Despite such precise details, all of this was circumstantial evidence and did not provide sufficient grounds for a guilty verdict. For this reason, Craig was not found guilty of Linda's murder. Investigators continued to believe that he was involved in the crime and tried to find additional evidence that would allow them to secure a guilty verdict, but all their attempts led to a dead end and ultimately the case stalled for many years. In 2014, 30 years after the murder, detectives reopened the investigation and decided to review the existing evidence. They handed samples of fingerprints from the van's glass to experts who tried to reconstruct them using modern technology. And when they finally succeeded and loaded the data into the database, the police finally had a match. The fingerprints belonged to Troy James O'Mara, who was already serving a life sentence. One and a half years after Linda's death, he killed a 22-year-old young woman and the details of this crime were very similar. His victim was returning from a shopping center with purchases for her upcoming wedding. When she approached her car, James forced her to sit in the car and drove her to a remote area where he subjected her to violence and killed her, tying her hands beforehand. Despite this similarity, James was never a suspect in Linda's case and was not even on the police's radar. The detectives remembered another fact. During the early stages of the investigation, several witnesses reported seeing a fair-haired teenager in the parking lot of the shopping center, and given that James was only 17 years the description. Despite this, the police wanted to find as much evidence as possible, and an interesting turn of events awaited them. It turned out that a DNA sample of the person who assaulted Linda had been stored at the warehouse all this time, although it was no longer listed as evidence in the documents. The investigators discovered it almost by chance. But here was one problem. The sample was very small and had already begun to degrade, so local experts were unable to extract the perpetrator's profile from it. Then the investigators sent it to a modern laboratory located in New Zealand. The experts managed to extract the profile and it fully matched James' DNA. All of this took several years for the investigators. Considering that the criminal was already serving a life sentence, they could take their time and properly prepare the case for trial. In the end, James was only arrested on August 26, 2018, almost 35 years after the murder. At that time, the man was 51 years old. He had spent more than half his life in prison and had earned several more charges during the time. James twice attacked guards and even managed to escape from prison once, but he was caught the next day. After his arrest for Linda's murder, he denied his guilt and preparation for trial began. The process lasted for several years, but in March 2021, the criminal decided to confess. He said he saw Linda in the parking lot. The young woman was sitting in her car, eating a sandwich. He got into her car and threatened her to drive to a remote location where he assaulted and killed her. 
When the judge asked him about his motives, James noted that he simply wanted to kill a random young woman that day. As a result, James was sentenced to 30 years in prison for Linda's murder, although he was given the right to apply for early release in July 2022, since he had already served more than 30 years in prison. But at the moment, he continues to serve his sentence, although he may be released in the next few years. Linda's father did not live to see the police find her killer. He had spent decades wanting to know what happened to his daughter, but he passed away after a long battle with cancer. After his wife's death, Robert vowed to never marry again as his heart belongs to Linda forever. At the trial, after the verdict was given, he thanked the investigators and declared that James had forever deprived him of his family. As for Craig and the informant's story, things are quite ambiguous. It should be noted that the informant was a hardened criminal himself and could have received significant benefits from helping to solve the case. It is possible that he lied to the police and all the key facts about the case could have been gathered from the newspapers. Share your opinion about this story in the comments and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. A young woman who won a beauty contest was found dead in her own apartment. The police began searching for the culprit, not suspecting the consequences it would bring. Today we will tell you what happened to Sheila Josephine Harris and why this case outraged the public. Sheila Josephine Harris was born on February 26, 1963 in Douglas County, Nevada. From an early age, she wanted to become an actress or a model, so she actively participated in various beauty contests in her school years. When she was young, her parents divorced and her mother remarried. Later, they had two more daughters and Sheila actively helped her mother take care of her younger sisters. In her senior year of high school, Sheila won a local beauty contest in her district and planned to compete for Miss Nevada and Miss Carson City. In case of victory, she intended to apply to participate in the National Beauty Contest. Despite such ambitious plans, the young woman decided to obtain a higher education in the field of business and trade. After graduating from high school at the age of 18, Sheila moved to Carson City and enrolled in she rented an apartment and took a part-time job at a supermarket to cover her living expenses. The young woman took her studies and worked very seriously because she wanted to have a good education and provide for herself independently. She also dated a guy named Stephen Furlong. They tried to see each other as often as possible, but due to her studies and work, they only managed to spend time together a few times a week. On January 4, 1982, Sheila went to his house to check on Stephen's condition since he had recently broken his arm and the young woman periodically visited him. She spent the evening with him and his parents, after which she went home. The next day, Sheila was supposed to start her morning shift at the supermarket, so she wanted to go to bed early. Despite his injury, Stephen decided to see her off and departed at the entrance to the residential complex. The next day, Sheila did not show up for work. The store manager noticed her absence and was greatly surprised since the young woman had never been late, not even once. He called her home phone, but there was no answer. So he contacted Sheila's mother and asked, has anything happened to her? At first, her mother thought that Sheila might have just overslept. But when the building manager said he had called her home phone, the woman became nervous. She decided to go to Sheila's apartment and asked her friend to accompany her because she was very worried and afraid to go alone. The mother arrived at the apartment complex with a spare set of keys and her friend entered the apartment first. There she was met with a horrifying sight that made her scream. Sheila lay in bed without signs of life. There was blood around her and bruises were visible all over her neck. Her friend tried to stop the young woman's mother from seeing this heart-wrenching sight, but she still entered the apartment and saw her dead daughter. Police who arrived at the scene began to investigate the crime scene. They immediately realized that the young woman had been strangled and had been dealt several strong blows with a heavy object. A dent was found in the wall near the bed, presumably left by Sheila herself trying to fend off the attacker. In addition, wood chips were found on her clothing and body. Medical examiners concluded that the young woman had been tied up and subjected to violence. The perpetrator had dealt her several blows, presumably with a board or other heavy piece of wood, and then strangled her with an electric cable which caused her death. Investigators could not find either the board or the cable in the apartment, but they noticed that the wire had been ripped off the desk lamp, which could have been the murder weapon. Experts were able to extract biological material from the perpetrator, but they could not conduct a DNA test in 1982. At first, the detectives thought that this crime could have been committed without preparation and that the perpetrator could have been mentally unstable. Their thoughts were led to this by the cruelty with which he dealt with his victim. 
However, it quickly became clear that this attack was meticulously planned. Firstly, no signs of forced entry were found on the door, which means Sheila must have let the perpetrator in herself. Secondly, none of the neighbors in the apartment building heard anything. The killer must have carefully planned every step to carry out such a cruel crime without making a sound. Additionally, the killer took a wire and a wooden board depriving the police of two important pieces of evidence. All of this led investigators to believe that the perpetrator was not a first-time offender, possibly a serial killer or someone who had been planning the attack. Long before it happened, with almost no evidence, investigators began searching for witnesses. They interviewed all of the building's residents, but none of them noticed anything suspicious that night. The area where Sheila lived was on the outskirts of the city and was not considered safe. She chose the apartment because the rent was low and she could not afford to live in a more prestigious neighborhood on her salary from the supermarket. This only complicated the police's work since many people in this area were somehow involved in criminal activity. For a month after the murder, investigators carefully studied local residents and tried to identify who might be involved. As a result, they questioned about 70 men, but they were unable to establish their involvement. From the first days, the police had the most obvious suspect, Sheila's boyfriend, Stephen. Statistics show that it is often people close to the victim who commit such crimes, and Stephen might have been the last person to see Sheila before the murder. He said he accompanied her to the entrance, but detectives were not quick to believe him. The young man did not have an alibi for the rest of that day and could not prove that he did not enter Sheila's apartment. During the investigation, another problem arose. Local media learned the detectives were considering Stephen as a suspect. Journalists quickly discovered that the young man's family had close ties to the police. His brother was the sheriff of Carson City and his father held the same position before retiring. As a result, newspapers began to speculate on the topic of whether the police were covering up the young woman's killer. That Stephen was behind the crime and his brother and father were using their position and connections to cover it up. This led to people protesting, sending angry letters to Stephen and his family, and even threatening violence. The residents of Carson City demanded that the teenager be immediately arrested, and some even called for the death penalty. The situation was further complicated by the fact that just a few days after Stephen's murder, he was arrested for being drunk in public. Nevertheless, investigators tried to determine if the boy had a motive for committing such a crime. After speaking with Sheila's friends, they concluded that the couple had never had any serious problems and that the young woman had never complained of aggression from Stephen. In addition, the victim suffered serious injuries that required the killer exert significant effort and Stephen had a broken arm at the time, making it almost impossible for him to do this. As a result, the detectives began to lean towards the belief in the boy's innocence, but it was too late. Under pressure from the public, threats, and constant accusations, Stephen took his own life before he could be definitively cleared of suspicion. After this, the police had only one candidate for the role of the murderer, a gardener and handyman named David Winfield Mitchell, who was assigned to the residential complex where Sheila lived. There was no direct evidence against him, but several indirect factors made investigators suspicious. Firstly, the man could enter any apartment in the complex to do some repair work. Secondly, shortly after the murder, he resigned and left in an unknown direction. The police tried to find him, but he seemed to have disappeared. When suspicions began to mount against Mitchell, detectives re-interviewed residents of the complex and other employees. They tried to find out if anyone had noticed any strange or suspicious behavior from the Mitchell couldn't take his eyes off pretty young women when they passed by. He silently watched them until they were out of sight. Several tenants found this strange and investigators increasingly believed that he was the one who killed Sheila. A man was declared wanted but over the next several years investigators failed to obtain any leads on his whereabouts. Meanwhile they found a hair in the victim's apartment that could have belonged to Mitchell. He was originally from the small island state of Trinidad and Tobago and experts were able to determine that the hair found matched his ethnicity. DNA analysis was still unavailable in those days, so they couldn't determine a 100% match with Mitchell's DNA. In 1986, four years after the murder, the police finally received a lead on the man's whereabouts. He was living outside the state and was soon arrested. During questioning, Mitchell denied his guilt and the detectives had only one card, a hair that presumably belonged to him. The suspect himself claimed that he had cleaned the apartment a month before Sheila moved in, which should explain where his hair came from. Investigators continued to believe that he was the one who killed the young woman, but they had no serious evidence. 
They understood that this case had zero chances in court, so they decided to release Mitchell. No judge would have found him guilty based solely on one hair, which could indeed have been left there during cleaning. Since then, there have been no developments in this case. Investigators were convinced that it was Mitchell who was the killer. So they didn't really try to find other suspects, but they couldn't prove the man's guilt, so the investigation was practically frozen. It was only in 1999, 13 years later, that the case was reopened. Sheila's mother heard about how new DNA analysis technologies could help solve such crimes and contacted the detective in charge of the case. The woman convinced him to send the killer's biological material to the laboratory and request a comparison with Mitchell's blood, which had been given after the questioning in 1986. After a long wait, the investigators finally received the long-awaited results. The semen sample from the victim's body matched David Mitchell's DNA completely. Experts also confirmed that it was his voice that was found in the victim's apartment. Thus, the police obtained 100% confirmation of his guilt. They faced another problem. Mitchell had left the USA for his home country where he got a job as a security guard in a government institution. Now investigators had to obtain his extradition, which was quite problematic. They had to go through all the bureaucratic red tape and prove to the government of Trinidad and Tobago that it was Mitchell who committed the murder. This process took several years, and federal authorities and the state government engaged in dialogue with the other state for the next seven years until 2006, when a decision was finally made to extradite him. The suspect was brought to Carson City, and soon one of the most high-profile trials in the state's history began. Firstly, DNA analysis was not as actively used in those days as it is now, and this technology still raised some doubts in society. Secondly, journalists paid a lot of attention to the fact that the victim's friend, Stephen, had taken his own life because of accusations against him. And now the court had to decide whether David was the real killer or whether the entire town had wrongly believed Stephen was guilty. Mitchell's lawyer used these doubts in his strategy and insisted that Stephen was the real killer and DNA analysis could be mistaken. The prosecution side refuted these arguments, citing compelling evidence that DNA testing in modern conditions has extremely low chances of error. Moreover, they had another indirect argument. On the day of the murder, Stephen had a cast on his hand. Firstly, the young man was unlikely to have been able to inflict all these injuries on the victim using one hand. Secondly, particles of the cast would undoubtedly have been found at the crime scene, but there were none. But these were not the only arguments of the prosecution side. During the trial, they revealed information that had not been publicly available before. It turned out that Mitchell had already been convicted of five episodes of violence against women. In the late 1960s, when the suspect lived in New York, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison for attacking three young women in their homes. Mitchell broke into their home, tied women with an electric cable, and subjected them to violence. After his release from prison, he moved to California, where in 1979, he broke into the house of two sisters. There, he attempted to assault them, but the young women managed to fend him off. They contacted the police, and nine months later, Mitchell was arrested. Here, the most interesting part began. Despite his previous sentence, the man received only three years in prison, of which he served one and a half and was released on parole. He was supposed to be deported to his homeland, but the man disappeared from the police, moved to Carson City, and got a job as a gardener in that same complex. All these facts outraged not only Sheila's family, but also the public. If the system had not allowed him to get out so early, the young woman would most likely be alive. The same goes for the management of the residential complex, which without knowing it, hired a serial rapist who fled from the police. The work of investigators also raised questions after Sheila's murder. They had no idea about Mitchell's criminal history. According to the prosecution's version, on the evening of Sheila's murder, David knocked on her door and said that he needed to do some repair work. He should have had a board with him, which he used to stun the victim. Then Mitchell committed all these atrocities with her and left the scene, taking the board and the electric cable with him. As a result, it took the jury only 30 minutes to unanimously find David guilty of the young woman's murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, but his lawyer tried to get more lenient conditions. He pointed out that for 25 years after the murder, Mitchell had reformed, lived an honest life, and had not harmed anyone. Fortunately, the court rejected these demands and left the original sentence in force. At the time we began his prison term, David was 63 years old. He spent most of his life on the loose and now he only has to spend the rest of his days behind bars. 
Sheila's mother thanked the court for not giving this monster the opportunity to walk free. She stated that if he had not been released early in the early 1980s, her daughter would be alive now. In all the story, there remained one question that haunted investigators. How many more victims could Mitchell have had? All his known crimes are undoubtedly serial in nature, so the criminal could have attacked other women. He spent 25 years at large out of police sight, and there is a high probability that his actions could have harmed other people. But whether the police will be able to uncover the truth is a big question. Share your opinion in the comments, and don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. A student who came to visit her family for a holiday went for a run and disappeared without a trace. The residents of the small village were shaken by this event as nothing like this had ever happened in their area before. Detectives began an investigation that lasted for many years and it was only after 28 years that everyone learned the gruesome truth that of the small village. Mandy Stavick was born on April 16, 1971 in the American city of Bellingham, Washington. She grew up in a large family with loving parents, two brothers, and a sister. Soon after Mandy's birth, her parents decided to move to a town called Palmer, Alaska. This place was known for its picturesque nature, safety, and the unity of its few thousand residents. The family lived in this town for several years, but when Mandy was three years old, her parents decided to divorce and she stayed with her mother. Nevertheless, she continued to see her father almost every day. A year later, a terrible tragedy struck their family. Mandy's 17-year-old brother went on a hunting trip and disappeared. The police later found his body, which had almost 20 bullet wounds. Despite all the investigators' efforts to solve the case, they could not find any suspects. For Mandy's family, this event was a real shock, but she continued to grow up joyful and active. She excelled academically, participated in many sports, and played various musical instruments. When Mandy was 12 years old, her mother decided to move back to Washington. To a small village called Acme, whose population at that time was less than 300 people and all the residents knew each other well. There were practically no serious crimes in this place and the woman decided that she and her three children would be better off there. Mandy enrolled in the local school, quickly made friends, continued to play sports, joined the school music group and was a good friend, and became a cheerleader. In addition, she loved the local nature and enjoyed going for runs towards the picturesque river. When Mandy was 17 years old, another tragedy struck her family. After the divorce, her father stayed in Palmer and started a new family. Having several children, and in 1988, Mandy's stepbrother drowned in a river. It was another blow for her and reminded her of her older brother's death. After graduating from high school, Mandy enrolled in Central Washington University in 1989, which was three hours away from her home. She wanted to become a pilot and strove to get straight A's. She lived in a dormitory, but whenever she had the chance, she visited her family, spent Thanksgiving with her relatives, and planned to stay there for a few more days. On November 24th, the day after the holiday, Mandy decided to go for a run. Usually, her mother accompanied her and rode her bike next to her, but this time she stayed home because her sister had come to visit her briefly. So, Mandy set off alone, taking the family's German shepherd with and ran along the road to the river, after which she turned around and ran back, totaling about five kilometers. Usually, the run took less than an hour, but this time Mandy was clearly delayed. When her brother returned home, he was surprised that Mandy was still not back. He was visiting a friend whose house was located along the road. The brother saw Mandy run back towards home, but after a few minutes, she ran in the opposite direction. He thought she had decided to do another lap, but even considering that, she should have returned home much earlier than him. As time passed, Mandy's relatives began to worry seriously about her. In addition to the fact that she had never run for so long before, she had plans for the evening. Before heading home for the holiday, she invited her dorm mate, who came with her. They were planning to go to a neighboring town that day to meet with friends. Two hours later, something happened that made the whole family worry even more. Their German shepherd returned home without Mandy, which was extremely strange. The mother of a young woman who had already lost a child once decided to immediately contact the police. And despite Mandy being 18 years old, the sheriff agreed to start the search right after the woman's call. Meanwhile, the mother began calling literally every resident of the village and asking if they had seen her daughter upon hearing that Mandy had disappeared. Many of them went out into the street and quickly organized their own search together with the young woman's relatives. They walked along the route she had run several times, but she was not found. Meanwhile, the police began questioning people close to Mandy. 
They learned that the young woman had a boyfriend named Rick whom she'd been dating since high school. The young woman's mother also said that the couple had broken up and gotten back together again. The investigators spoke with him but found no reason to suspect the young man. They questioned several other people while combing the area with the villagers. People on SUVs, horses, and helicopters had joined the search. The local dog handler even tried to work with a shepherd dog, hoping that it would lead them to Mandy. However, the dog was clearly frightened and did not want to leave the porch of its house. The search continued until late at night, but it yielded no results. The next day it continued and the police managed to find the first worrying clue. Volunteers found women's sports pants on one of the back roads. They were covered in mud, looked old, and had several holes. The pants were immediately shown to Mandy's mother, but she hesitated to say that they belonged to her daughter. Despite this, the police still sent them to the laboratory. Experts found traces of male semen on them. From all the men who were familiar with Mandy and were in the area, but no matches were found. The FBI's general database, which contains DNA of convicted criminals, did not exist yet that year, so investigators could not do anything with this clue. Meanwhile, specialists with search dogs began to participate in the search and soon they discovered a new lead. They managed to find traces of the young woman on the dirt road as well as the tracks of her sheepdog. But there was one strange moment. Their tracks stopped at the same place. From this, only one conclusion could be drawn. Mandy must have gotten into someone's car. Detectives suggested that she may have been abducted and forced into a car. But experts disproved this assumption as there would have been a different scene at the point where the tracks ended as the young woman should have resisted. In reality, it looked as though she got into the car of her own accord, meaning that the driver could have been someone she knew. On the third day of the search, police, along with firefighters, began searching the nearby river that flowed alongside the road where the young woman was last seen. There they made a distressing discovery. About five kilometers downstream from the village, they noticed a female body in the water. After retrieving it, they immediately realized that it was Mandy as she was naked except for her socks and sneakers. The police did not see any serious injuries except for several large scratches on her legs. In connection with this, they began to speculate if the young woman could have drowned, but this version made no sense. Firstly, it was the end of November and the water in the river was very cold, so Mandy could not have gone into it voluntarily, especially without clothes. In addition, the depth of the river in that place was significantly lower than human height and the young woman could have stood there safely. The medical experts examined the victim's body and found a head injury which was most likely caused by a strong blow. However, they determined that this injury could not have been the cause of death. In the end, the experts concluded that the young woman died of suffocation in the water. In other words, she drowned. In addition, the medical experts found evidence of violence against the victim and were able to extract biological material from the perpetrator as well as detect male DNA under the victim's fingernails. Based on all this, the police developed the most likely version of what happened. Someone kidnapped Mandy on the road, dragged her into a car, and drove her to the river where an unknown perpetrator subjected her to violence. After that, the young woman managed to escape, evidenced by the scratches on her legs, most likely caused by prickly vegetation along the riverbank. At some point, the criminal caught up to Mandy, hit her on the head, and threw her into the water. Forensic experts identified a DNA profile and compared it to samples from everyone who was in any way connected to the case. In total, they checked over 30 men, but no matches were found. Police continued to search for any leads by questioning all residents of the village and surrounding areas. Apart from Mandy's brother, another ACME resident saw her on the day of her disappearance. The man parked near his house and saw the young woman running along the road. When she disappeared from view, a dark pickup truck drove past. At that moment, the man did not attach any importance to it. But after Mandy's murder, he shared his observation with the police. He could not remember the model of the pickup truck and refused to provide detectives with his DNA sample. This behavior seemed suspicious and they obtained a court order to compel the man to give his DNA. However, it did not match the sample found on the victim's body. The murder received active media coverage. Police received several thousand tips. Unfortunately, they all led to dead ends. And as a result, the investigation dragged on for years. Detectives were unable to identify any serious suspects, although they continued to actively consider various candidates. At some point, investigators speculated that an unknown serial killer known as the Green River Killer might be behind the crime. He was suspected of killing dozens of young women and he often dumped their bodies in rivers. 
However, no evidence in favor of this version was found. Even when the killer was caught and his identity became known, investigators could not link him to Mandy's murder. Due to the lack of evidence and new suspects, the investigation of this case periodically, detectives retrieved it from the archives, trying to find some fresh ideas, but it did not produce any results. In 2009, 20 years after Mandy's death, a new detective from the local police department reopened the investigation. Given that no new evidence had emerged over the past two decades, he decided to take a different approach. Together with his colleagues, they went around the entire village and surrounding areas, asking every male resident to provide their DNA sample. The detective's plan was quite simple. He understood that the killer of Mandy was most likely a local resident, and if they collected DNA samples from literally every man, there was a decent chance of finding the culprit among them. In its surroundings, this task seemed quite straightforward. But in practice, it turned out to be much more difficult. It took the police a whole four years to check all the men, and in the end, they didn't get a single match. The detectives realized that in 20 years since the murder, the killer could have moved somewhere else or even died. So, they began to dig through and try to track down literally every man who lived in the area at the time of 1989. In 2013, the police received an unexpected lead. Two women who grew up in the same village as Mandy went to a water park with their children. As they chatted, they remembered the infamous murder and began to discuss it. At some point, one of the women said that she suspected who might have killed Mandy. The other replied that she also suspected a specific person. And they both named the same name, Timothy Bass. At the time of the murder, he was 21 years old and lived just a few houses away from the victim. The women were shocked that they had been suspecting the same person all this time. But even more interesting were the reasons why they considered Timothy to be the culprit. One of the women said that Timothy had been hitting on her when they were teenagers. Once when she was in a car with Timothy and some other friends, he began to aggressively pursue her and make advances. The other friends intervened and since then, the woman had been seriously afraid of being near this person. The second woman's story was even more shocking. Several years after Mandy's murder, when the woman was already living with her husband and their newborn baby, Timothy knocked on her door one evening while her husband was at work. The woman was not surprised by his visit since he and her husband were friends. Timothy said that he had been passing by after hunting and needed to use the phone. The woman let him in, but Timothy started to behave strangely. Instead of making a call, he stood there with the phone in his hand and then put it down. He then began to tell the woman that he had been in love with her for a long time and offered to engage in a sexual relationship. She refused and demanded that he leave. But Timothy continued to insist aggressively. The woman then threatened to call the police and only after that did he leave their home. Sharing these stories, they decided to go to the police together and talk about their suspicions about Timothy. When asked why they waited so long, the woman replied that they were not sure of his involvement in the murder. In such a small community, they would never be forgiven if they accused an innocent man person of murder, so none of them dared to share this information. Detectives immediately became interested in this person and noticed something interesting. During the initial investigation, none of their colleagues interviewed Timothy or asked him to provide a DNA sample. This was very strange. The young man did not appear in old police reports, despite being acquainted with the victim. Living nearby and his house being next to the same road that the young woman ran on. Digging deeper, investigators also found that Mandy was friends with his younger brother, Tom. Another suspicious moment was that Timothy moved to another city less than two months after the murder. Perhaps this was the reason why the guy remained out of the police's sight. At that time, they were busy with a huge amount of leads and checking people who voluntarily cooperated with them. Timothy settled in the town of Emerson, located 40 kilometers from his old home. Shortly before moving, he married and eventually had three children. Opening his criminal history, detectives found another alarming fact. In 2010, his wife filed a statement with the police that Timothy had beaten her and their children, but the investigators were most surprised by one small detail contained in this statement. In it, his wife described why Timothy was a danger to their family. Among the stories of domestic violence, she briefly mentioned her husband's strange behavior. While watching documentary crime films, when they watched similar programs together, Timothy for how poorly they commit murders, leaving behind a lot of evidence. The man also loved to say that he would never make the same mistakes and would not have been caught. After studying all this information, the detectives began to seriously consider his involvement in Mandy's murder. They went to his house to ask a series of questions and request a voluntary DNA sample. When the most interesting part began, 
Timothy claimed that he did not remember the crime and could not even remember who Mandy Stavik was. This statement immediately made detectives doubt his words. First of all, all the residents of the village with a population of less than 300 knew each other. Secondly, Timothy lived just a few houses away from the Stavik family and it was simply impossible to imagine that he did not know her. Moreover, after the murder, this case was talked about not only in the village itself, but also in all neighboring towns. It was the first such crime in the area in many years and for local residents, this topic remained number one for many months. Therefore, detectives did not hurry to believe the man's words and they asked him to provide a DNA sample. But Timothy refused, which aroused even more suspicion. Unfortunately, they had absolutely no evidence that could link him to the murder, so investigators could not obtain a court order that would require the man to provide his DNA. Then they decided to go another way. Detectives found out that Timothy had worked as a courier at a bakery located in a neighboring town for many years. They went there and talked to the manager, asking him to provide them with information about Timothy's roots for the next few days. The police planned to track him and get some item on which the man could leave his DNA. They did not tell the manager which particular crime their employee was suspected of. Detectives only said that an investigation was underway, but the woman refused to provide this information without the permission of higher management. The police contacted them and they demanded a court order. Thus investigators were again at a dead end. They continued to study Timothy's biography and tried to find new clues that would allow them to obtain the much-needed court decision. But all their attempts led to nothing. And the case was stalled for several more years. In 2015, the police came to his house again, asked a few questions, and requested a DNA sample, but he refused again. It continued until 2017 when something unexpected happened. A woman named Kim Wagner, who was a manager at the bakery, went to a bar with her husband and friends, all of whom used to live in Acme and were around the same age as Mandy when she was murdered. At some point, they started talking about the case, which had haunted the locals for decades. Suddenly, one of the friends mentioned Timothy Bass, who lived near the victim's home, and it dawned on Kim when the police came to her workplace and asked for information about his whereabouts. She didn't even think it could be related to Mandy Stavik's murder. And then Kim started thinking that her colleague was the killer. This thought stayed with her for a long time. At some point, detectives came to her workplace again, hoping that she had changed her position since their previous conversation and their hope was justified. Kim invited the investigators to her office and asked directly, do they suspect Timothy of killing Mandy? The police were surprised but did not deny it and then the woman provided them with all the necessary information and interesting observations about her colleague. She had known the man for many years and always found him strange. When one of her friends mentioned that Bass lived near Mandy's home during those years, she began to seriously consider his involvement in the case. So she decided to help the investigators. The detective started following Timothy and new difficulties emerged. He always wore gloves at work, which prevented experts from taking a DNA sample from objects he touched. The man also did not smoke, so the police could not even obtain a cigarette but with his saliva. Bass did not even have a workplace in the bakery since he worked exclusively on delivering products. In addition, another strange fact complicated the investigator's task. Timothy never threw away his garbage at work. He stored it in his van and took it home the detectives immediately realized that such behavior could not be a coincidence. Apparently, Timothy understood that the police suspected him of Mandy's murder and started making sure that they did not get any items with his DNA. But in the end, the detectives were lucky to find out that they couldn't obtain the suspect's biological material. Kim offered to help. Laws work in such a way that police officers are not allowed to ask third parties to obtain evidence for them. In such a case, the evidence will not be admissible in court even if the suspect's guilt is obvious. However, if any person voluntarily hands over evidence to the investigators, they have the right to accept and use it. Thus, Kim offered to obtain some DNA samples from base and the detectives waited. The suspect was very careful and it took the woman a long time to achieve her goal. Only after three months did she see the man drink coke from a plastic cup and then throw it away in the trash with the can. Kim waited until Timothy left, took both pieces of evidence, and handed them over to the police. They immediately sent the can with the count to the laboratory, and the experts extracted a DNA profile from them. It fully matched the biological material found on Mandy's body. Having finally obtained the long-awaited evidence, the police immediately went after the man and arrested him. Twenty-eight years after the murder, the suspect was finally charged. 
During the interrogation, Timothy denied his guilt until the investigators told him about the DNA sample match. Hearing this, the man immediately changed his story and said that he and Mandy had a secret affair. They supposedly started dating many months before her murder and had to hide their relationship from everyone because she had a boyfriend. According to Timothy, on the day of her death, Mandy came to his house during her jog. They had an intimate encounter and she left. He added that his father was at home at the time, but it was impossible to use him as a witness since he had passed away long ago. The detectives did not believe the story for a second. In their opinion, Timothy made up the whole story about the secret affair just to explain the presence of his DNA on the victim's body. Moreover, as proof of his words, he referred to his deceased father who could not refute this information. Investigators talked to Mandy's relatives and friends and they all expressed complete confidence that the young woman would never date Timothy. He was very strange, avoided communication with other people, and spent most of his time alone. The detectives decided to speak with Timothy's wife. Despite the fact that the woman had filed statements against her husband and lived separately, they were still married. Here, the police were waiting for another interesting turn. The woman suddenly said that on the day of Mandy's murder, she was with Timothy at his house and he was there all day. The detectives did not believe her story, but her words created possible difficulties for the court. On the other hand, they contradicted Timothy's version, according to which Mandy came to his house on the day of the murder and had an intimate relationship with him. The trial began in May 2019. Timothy's lawyer continued to insist that his client was innocent and that his DNA got on the victim's body as a result of a consensual intimate contact. The prosecution, however, insisted that there was no evidence to support this version. Timothy never called Mandy, never wrote her notes or letters, and no one among the witnesses saw them together. It was much more likely that Bass had a one-sided crush on the young woman and was even obsessed with her. Investigators found out that the guy started attending all the sports matches when Mandy joined the school team. Before that, he had absolutely no interest in sports. In addition, his windows overlooked the road where the young woman was running and he could watch her during her runs. He decided to talk to her and caught up with her. Perhaps the guy started to harass Mandy, but the young woman resisted or he persuaded her to get into his car on some pretext. Later, Bass took her to a deserted place, subjected her to violence, and then the young woman managed to escape. The guy caught up with her near the riverbank, hit her on the head with some object, and threw her body into the water. Timothy's wife testified as a witness in court who, by that time, had already divorced him, and this time, she surprised everyone again. Instead of sticking to her original story, the woman told a new one. According to her, she did not remember that she was at Timothy's house on the day of the murder. The woman added that Bass had forced her to lie to the police during the first interrogation. He could go to jail. At that time, she seriously feared that her husband might harm her or her children, so she agreed to lie to the police. This deprived the suspect of his only alibi, but the court heard even more interesting details. Tom's younger brother told that after Timothy was asked for a DNA sample, he started to get very anxious about it. When Tom asked him what was going on, his brother told him the same story about a secret affair with the victim. Timothy also asked him to tell the police that he had also had a sexual relationship with Mandy, but Tom refused to lie. Even Timothy's own mother testified against him when she visited him in jail and he passed her a note asking her to lie to the police that they had gone to the store together on the day of the murder to buy Christmas gifts. But she refused to lie. In the note, Timothy also asked her to testify against his own father and try to convince investigators that he was the real killer. After all this, the defendant's lawyer tried to convince the jurors that Timothy's DNA sample had been obtained illegally. He insisted that the police had asked a civilian to obtain the man's biological material outside the rules. However, Kim Wagner refuted these claims and said that she had offered her help to the police. In 1989, this murder deeply shook her and she continued to think about it regularly for decades. Learning that her colleague was a suspect, she wanted to help solve the case. Moreover, by that time, she already had a daughter and Kim could barely imagine what Mandy's mother felt. During those years, the trial lasted several weeks and after all the evidence presented, the jury found Timothy Bass guilty of murder. He was sentenced to 27 years in prison with the possibility of applying for early release after 24 years. Mandy's mother, who was 83 years old at the time, thanked the detectives for their work. Although she had lost two children in her life, she was still glad that the guilty party had been punished. In 1990, Mandy's relatives established a scholarship in her name at the high school where she attended. 
They continue to support this program to this day, annually awarding the most talented students who study music. The foundation of this scholarship was $25,000 collected by the residents of Acme and other towns. Initially, this money was offered as a reward for information. But after the case was solved, it was decided to put it into this program. Share your opinion on the story in the comments and we'll be happy to answer your questions. A young woman was found dead at her workplace. Detectives found several unusual clues, but they were unable to catch the culprit. Several years later, when the police re-examined all the clues, they made a very unexpected breakthrough. Carrie Nelson was born on December 13, 1980, in the small American town of Laverne, Minnesota. She had loving parents, a younger sister, and many friends. Carrie was kind, empathetic, and always tried to help her loved ones. After graduating from the local high school, she enrolled in college in the neighboring state of North Dakota. She wanted to become a doctor so that she could help others. While in college, she met a young man named Mike Kellen and they became engaged after a while. Carrie tried to balance her college studies with part-time work at the National Blue Mound State Park located near her hometown. Her duties included selling park tickets and escorting guests who came to relax at the camping site, go hiking, or see the bison. In addition to being a relatively easy job, she could also spend a lot of time in nature, enjoying the picturesque landscapes. On May 20, 2001, she went to work as usual. That day, besides her, only one young woman named Rebecca, who was doing an internship at the park, was working there. In addition to her main duties, Carrie had to train and introduce her to the work process. Carrie's shift started at 8 a.m. and was supposed to end at 3.30 p.m. For most of the day, she was with Rebecca, explaining the work nuances. Around 12.45, Rebecca went to the office building located at the other end of the park and Carrie stayed in a small room at the entrance. Rebecca returned around 2.30 p.m. She entered the building through the back door and immediately saw a horrific scene. Carrie lay motionless on the floor with a pool of blood near her head. At around the same time, a shocked Rebecca heard the front door. Thinking it might be the same person who attacked her colleague, she immediately ran out through the back door and rushed home. The young woman lived in a house located within the park grounds because her father was a manager, so she quickly ran there. Rebecca told her parents what had happened and her father immediately ran there while the young woman's mother called the police. The man arrived at the building and found no one there except Carrie. He tried to feel her pulse and realized that she was dead. After that he closed the curtains, locked the front door and called 911. At around the same time another call came in to the police. It turned out that when Rebecca discovered her colleague's body inside, a park visitor walked in, not the attacker. The woman went to the registration desk and saw Carrie's body next to a puddle of blood, then returned to her car and also called 911. Police arrived on the scene and began their investigation. The young woman's body was lying behind the registration desk where phones and cash registers were located, and things and papers were scattered around. One of the phone receivers was off the hook, the plastic pen of Carrie's chair was broken, and its pieces were on the floor. Based on this, the police assumed that a struggle had taken place between the victim and the attacker. After talking to the managers, the investigators found out that two bank bags intended for money storage had disappeared from the building. In addition, cash was taken from the cash register, with the total amount stolen being approximately $2,000. On the floor, detectives found several clues. Men's wristwatches with a torn strap and a pack of cigarettes. Considering that Carrie did not smoke, the police assumed that the cigarettes were left by her killer. As for the watches, they assumed that the young woman tore them off the perpetrators during the struggle. Large particles of orange-colored stone were also found on the floor. The manager told investigators that these particles likely came from the decorative stone with the park's name, which was located on the registration desk. The police searched all the rooms and could not find the perpetrator. Considering that blood spatters were visible on the walls and ceiling of the room, they immediately assumed that this stone was the murder weapon. At the same time, their colleagues blocked the road leading to the park entrance and began questioning all visitors. The couple who stopped at the campground reported that around 2.30 p.m., a white car with a brown vinyl top drove past them at high speed. Unfortunately, they did not remember the model or license plate number of the vehicle. The investigation was complicated by the fact that there were no surveillance cameras in the park since crimes that were very rare. The available evidence included a wristwatch, a pack of cigarettes, and the vague testimony of witnesses. Medical experts examined the victim's body and concluded that the cause of death was blows to the head with a heavy object. 
They suggested that the perpetrator may have used a large decorative stone, but this version could only be confirmed after its discovery. According to the investigators, the attack on Carrie occurred between 2 p.m. and 2.30 p.m. They found a love letter that she had written to her fiancé at her workplace. In the letter, Carrie expressed her eagerness for their wedding and described her desire to have two children. She put the date and time of 2 p.m. that day on the letter. Another interesting fact was that the men's watch found next to the victim's body stopped at 2.16 p.m. Perhaps they stopped working just after Carrie had taken them off her attacker's wrist. Police cordoned off the park and began searching for additional clues. Five days later, they found the decorative stone in a nearby stream. Apparently, the killer took it with him and threw it into the stream from a bridge. While driving over it, medical experts compared the relief of the stone with Carrie's head injuries and confirmed that it was the murder weapon. However, the water had washed away all fingerprints and DNA traces that the perpetrator may have left. No other clues were found and the police began searching for a possible suspect. They first looked closely at Carrie's fiancé, but he had a reliable alibi. At the time of the murder, he was attending a funeral about 110 kilometers away from the park. Around 3 p.m. that day, he tried to call Carrie at her work phone. At that time, he had no idea that his fiancé was dead. Detectives interviewed park employees and received an interesting lead. Several people told them that Carrie had complained to them. Multiple times about her 26-year-old colleague named Stephen. Carrie reported that he continuously asked her out on a date, despite her being engaged. Stephen ignored her refusals and behaved quite persistently, causing Carrie to fear him. Additionally, the man used heavy narcotics and sold them to park visitors. Carrie mentioned to her colleagues that she was considering reporting him to the police. Or management. The detectives immediately questioned him and he did not have a reliable alibi for the time of the murder. He did not work that day and claimed he was at his daughter's birthday party a few kilometers away from the park. However, he arrived at the party around 3 p.m., which means he could have had enough time to commit the crime. In addition, he drove a white Cadillac, while witnesses saw a light-colored vehicle leaving the park at high speed. Digging deeper, the detectives found out that Stephen had financial difficulties. This gave him a motive to commit robbery, especially since he knew where the money was kept. The detectives also suspected that he may have learned about Carrie's plans to report him and decided to murder her. They seized his car and took a DNA sample from him. Meanwhile, the forensic team finished collecting fingerprints and DNA samples from the crime scene, including DNA from a men's wristwatch. In total, 135 different fingerprints were found at the scene, excluding all park employees, including Stephen, leaving 38 unknown prints. As for the wristwatch, three different DNA samples were found on it. The problem was that these samples were not enough to create a full profile since DNA analysis technology was not yet advanced enough in 2001. As a result, experts had to work with partial profiles. They tried to add them to databases, but the results were inconclusive. The system showed them 19 possible matches and during the investigation, the police confirmed that none of these people were related to the murder. However, the experts were able to directly compare the obtained samples with other DNA. They determined that one of the samples belonged to Carrie and the other two did not match any of the park employees, including Stephen. Detectives did not rush to rule him out as he had a motive and opportunity to commit the crime. But there was no evidence against him. No other leads were found and the case remained unsolved for months. A year after the murder, a prisoner serving time in the local jail came forward to the police. He told them that his cellmate, Anthony Powers, had boasted to him about being responsible for Carrie's murder. Detectives investigated and found that Powers had an extensive criminal history, mostly for bank robberies, which had landed him in jail multiple times. Interestingly, Powers had escaped from prison shortly before Carrie's murder and was caught after the fact. His fingerprints and DNA did not match those found at the crime scene. Moreover, the witness's description of the murder did not match reality. The detectives concluded that both prisoners were attempting to deceive them for a reward of $50,000. For information leading to solving of the case, since Powers was already serving a life sentence, additional charges did not scare him. Additionally, in the event of a guilty verdict, he could have avoided being transferred to a federal prison and remained in the state correctional facility, which he preferred. The case remained unsolved for several years. Detectives regularly reviewed the case, hoping to find new evidence, but their efforts were fruitless. They even put up a photo of Carrie in their office to remind themselves of the case every day. In 2007, the case was reopened. 
By that time, DNA analysis technology had significantly advanced and experts re-examined the wristwatch. This time, they were able to identify three precise DNA profiles, one belonging to Carrie, the second to an unknown man, and the third to an unknown woman. Both of these samples were run through the state database, but no matches were found. Then the detectives remembered an interesting detail. A special sticker was found on the pack of cigarettes discovered next to the victim's body. In those days, each state had to label tobacco products so the police knew for sure that the pack was purchased in South Dakota. The detectives then sent the DNA samples to their colleagues in that state. And here they had a long-awaited breakthrough. When they ran these profiles through the South Dakota database, one of them showed a complete match. The man turned out to be 35-year-old Randy LaRoyal Sweeney. This name had never appeared in police reports in Carrie's case. So it was a surprise for the investigators. Randy turned out to be a serial robber, and at that time, he was serving a 30-month sentence in a South Dakota prison. At the time of the murder, he was out on parole. The police also discovered that he had a light-colored Oldsmobile Delta at that time, which matched the witness's description. The investigators checked his fingerprints, and they matched several prints found at the murder scene. Despite all this, detectives wanted to gather as much evidence as possible before charging him. Randy had only one month left to serve in prison, so the police decided to act as quickly as possible. They spoke to his wife, not mentioning what her husband was suspected of. The woman was already used to Randy regularly coming to the attention of the police for robberies and thefts, so she was not surprised by their visit. The detectives showed her photos of a watch and the woman immediately confirmed that they belonged to her husband. She also said that she sometimes wore them and the investigators immediately realized that the last DNA sample from the watch belonged to her. Then they decided to reveal everything and told her that they suspected her husband of killing a young woman. The woman burst into tears. But the police quickly realized that she was primarily scared for herself. Learning that her DNA might be on the watch, she thought that she too would be accused of the murder. On April 19th, detectives came to visit Randy in prison and attempted to speak with him without specifying what he was being suspected of. However, Randy refused to talk without a lawyer present. After the unsuccessful interrogation, Randy called his wife. As all prison calls are recorded, the police were able to listen in. The woman was angry and asked, what did he do? She revealed the detectives were investigating him for a murder that occurred in Blue Mound State Park and was more worried about her DNA being found on a watch. At times, she began to cry and scream that she didn't want to go to jail for a crime she had nothing to do with. Randy, on the other hand, repeated that he knew nothing about it. The woman actively cooperated with the police, providing her DNA samples and allowing them to search their home. She also gave them several photos of Randy, one of which showed him sitting behind the wheel of a white car similar to the one witnesses saw. In another photo, the man's watch was visible and was fastened to the fourth class, just like the watch found at the crime scene. Additionally, his wife confirmed that Randy smoked the same brand of cigarettes that were found near the body. All of this was enough to take the case to trial. Randy was charged on May 8, 2007, one day before his release. He was immediately transferred to a prison in Minnesota and the prosecution began preparing for the trial. According to their version of events, Randy initially chose the park building as an easy target for robbery. There were no cameras or guards, but there was cash. When he entered, Carrie may have been in another room seeing that nobody was there. Randy began stealing money from the cash register, but the young woman returned and caught him in the act. A struggle ensued and the man may have used threats to make her open the safe. Afterward, he took a decade of stone and struck her more than five times because he feared leaving a witness alive. Even his relatives, including his wife, testified against him in court. They all said that Randy regularly committed thefts, used to ban substances, and had serious gambling problems which constantly put him in debt. His former cellmate told how Randy mentioned leaving his watch at the crime scene. Another cellmate claimed that after the police came to interrogate Randy in jail, he said, this time they got me. I'm looking at life. Randy's lawyers insisted that he had nothing to do with the murder. According to their version, Randy lost his watch sometime before the incident and the real killer found it. However, this version conflicted with the results of DNA analysis. There were three samples of genetic material on the watch. Randy's, his wife's, and Carrie's. Randy claimed that on that day he went fishing near a town about 150 kilometers away from the park. However, since he supposedly was there alone, no one could confirm his alibi. He also said that he had been in the park only once, long before the murder. 
He admitted that he left his fingerprints there at that time. There was another discrepancy. One of Randy's fingerprints was found on a leaflet that was made only four days before the murder. All defense arguments had no weight and contradicted real evidence. And Randy's lawyers tried to blame someone else. First, he called Powers and another inmate to testify, but their story still did not match reality. Then he began to harass the victim's fiancé, constantly hinting that he could be the real killer. The trial lasted until August 15, 2008. After six hours of deliberation, the jury found Randy guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After that, he continued to insist on his innocence and filed multiple appeals, but they were all rejected. From the beginning, all his defense was built on absurd versions that contradicted DNA analysis and other evidence, so there are no chances for his case to ever be reconsidered. Share your opinion about this story in the comments and don't forget to like this video.